T. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia, once said this, all people dream, but not equally. Those who dream at night in the dusty recesses of their mind awake to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous people, for they may act their dreams with open eyes to make it happen. I want to talk to you tonight as dreamers of the day, people who make things happen. Fame is about mental health. Fame is about dignity. Fame is about bringing things out into the open. Fame in the end is about telling stories and making a difference in little ways and big ways. So I thought the best way for me to start was not to talk about my life and what I've done, but rather to tell you a story. And I'd like to tell you the story of Bill and Jim. Bill went to Lawrence Park Collegiate in North Toronto. He was a good athlete. He did pretty well at school. He was an extraordinary golfer. He was the second best golfer in Ontario. He won his club championship a number of times. He went off to the University of Toronto to Victoria College, where he did quite well there. He had many friends. He was well liked. He was popular. That was Bill. When he was 24, he took his life. He jumped out of the second floor of Sunnybrook Hospital where he was staying. He had not been diagnosed that at that time. People discovered later that it was schizophrenia. To any family who's lost a child, this is a tragedy. Because mums and dads are not supposed to bury their children. We all know that. The natural life cycle is the natural life cycle and old people die and people are born. But Jim was 24. Jim had a younger brother. Or Bill had a younger brother, his name was Jim. Jim also went to Lawrence Park Collegiate. He also was a good golfer. He was head of the athletic board and he went off to the University of Western Ontario. He was a member of the golf team there and he graduated. And he went out into the workforce as many people who were young did in the 70s. He lost a couple of jobs. He went out west. He worked at the Banff Springs Hotel, and when he came home, he seemed a bit depressed. He went to his mom and dad who loved him. Mom and dads always loved their children. He went to a doctor, he went to a psychiatrist, and then he went to the Clark Institute, where he was diagnosed as having schizophrenia. He went through many of the things of the times of the 70s, Shock treatment, megavitamins, living on a farm, and eventually went home to his mom and dad who loved him. He couldn't get a job, at least not a full-time job, because it was hard. And most of his friends sort of wandered away. Friends do that sometimes. You see, schizophrenia is kind of the flip of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is when the young look after the old. In schizophrenia, more often, it's the old who look after the young. Jim was looking for something to do. And he heard about a little agency in downtown Toronto called Central Neighborhood House. It had a program, a home health program, and a stroke program, and Jim went to do some work there. He's been there now for almost 20 years. Every Friday, he goes to the stroke club. He got a tiny job at the University of Toronto, helping out in the career center, and he goes there two days a week. He helps clips things from newspapers and articles and magazines. 
After a while, his parents got older, and it wasn't as easy to live at home anymore. And he wound up in a, a group home run by Loft Community Services that's on St. George Street uh, and DuPont. He's been there about 11 years now. His father passed away, and two weeks ago, his mother passed away. Last week at the funeral, Jim read the 23rd Psalm. On Wednesday nights, Jim usually comes to my house because we play ping pong together. You see, Jim's my younger brother, and he's with us tonight. There's Jim over there. You see, Jim is of great courage because he gets up every day and he does his best. And that's what we look for in all of us, is to do our best. About four years ago, Jim and I were talking and we said, you know, it's, it's time to go public. It's time to talk about this because the more we talk about it and we tell people and people listen, we'll get underneath. And this will not be something that's strange. This is something that's ordinary. This is part of every family. And so we talked about it and we agreed that the Toronto Star could do a feature article about it. And then we went to talk to our mother. Our mother didn't like this idea of a feature article in the newspaper. I remember she said, dear, this is not a good thing to do. But we said it's important for everyone to be aware of this. Mom said, this could hurt you in your job, and I don't know that I want people in the retirement home to know about all of this. Now that's a common attitude for many people. I tried everything I could to convince my mom. I was totally unsuccessful but we felt we'd made the commitment to do it, and we were going to do it. And so I made the little talk, and the newspaper came, and they took a picture of Jim and myself, and the paper was all set to go the next day. And when I did the speech, one of the people in the room was Michael Wilson, who has done as much, frankly, for mental illness out of office than he ever did in political office. And not that everybody agreed with what he did in political office. That's another discussion for another time. But he came up to me and he said, that was a wonderful speech. Is there anything I can do? And I said, call my mother. <laughs> and he did. That night I got a call from my mother. She said, dear, I had a call from Michael Wilson. He's a Tory, you know, dear. And I said, yes, mom, I know that. She said, you know, I think this is a great idea. Would you get me 30 copies of the star tomorrow? Because I want to give it to all my friends. And she did just that. And what I learned there was that in changing attitudes, it's not always we can, can do it. Sometimes it's other people. And it's to find out who those people are and then get to them. Last week, I was in my mom's apartment cleaning out some of her, her letters and files. And there were two articles. One was about Michael Wilson and his son, Cam. And the other was about Jim and myself. She'd saved those, especially. So the first thing we have to be about is how we help change attitudes. The second thing I have uh, two young sons now, they're 19 and 15, and I think, Jim, that uh, Joseph called you this morning. Joseph's a really good guy. He spends a lot of time with Jim. But when Joseph was five, I decided it was time to teach him how to play golf. I love golf. My wife, who is very smart, said, I don't know he's 
ready to play golf. I said, he is ready to play golf. I am sure of that. And she said, okay. So I took him off to the golf course. And on this second hole, it was a little hole, I hit my shot right off the tee, right onto the green. I was very excited. I thought maybe I could make a birdie. My son hit his ball and it went down into the river. So I was on the green and he was looking for his ball in the river. And there were people on the tee who were getting a little frustrated. So I said a little too loudly, Joseph, hurry up. Nothing happened. So I said again, Joseph, hurry up. And then he said, Dad, come quick. So I ran down thinking he'd found maybe three balls. He said, look at the big frog. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I realized it was the big frog that was important. It wasn't the golf game. One of the things all of us need to do is listen really hard because there are messages that are passed that sometimes in our rush, we miss that connection. And that connection in mental health is often making the difference that moves us to profound joy. It's catching that moment and finding that thing that works for all of us. For Jim and myself, it's ping pong. We play every Wednesday night. We played when we were 10, and we're playing when Jim is 52, and I'm 59. I try to deny it, but we've been playing together for over 40 years. And Michael, you know your dad, he plays chess with his brother David, and he beats him every time. They've been playing chess together probably for 50 years, maybe 60. Those are good things. The things that connect us over time are worth doing. And they're worth taking the time to do. And for people like myself who sometimes say I'm very busy, those are the important things. My, my wife, who is very smart, uh, says this to me as I go off to make a speech. She says, I know you make good speeches, but if you don't make it at home, you don't make it anywhere. <laughs> that is very good advice. <laughs> we make it at home first, and we make it by taking time. The next thing we do is we make sure we tell our stories to anybody who will listen. And sometimes to some who aren't quite ready to listen because we connect with them. And every time I talk now, I find, and I give talks on other topics, but I always wind the story of Jim and Bill in. Always four or five people came up and said, you know, I want to tell you about my sister, my brother, my son, my daughter, my uncle, my aunt. Or just today at work, one of my staff came in and said, closed the door and said, can we talk? It seems to me it is in that talking that we get to breakthroughs. Because the data is overwhelming, right? The new report that came out from Statistics Canada, it is startling, particularly for young people. How many people are on their own, afraid to say, I need help? or even worse, where to get help. Groups like FAME are about support. They are about making things happen. And a, an event like tonight, which in effect thanks people, that's a good thing to do. Winning prizes, that's a good thing to do. Creating an award of FAME, a Hall of Fame, that's a wonderful thing to do. But when that passes, and it does, we all go home. We all go to our own places. And it is at that point that to me what a volunteer is about is reaching 
out. It is reaching out. And we do that in different ways. For me, it started when I went to Trinidad in the West Indies. I spent two years there in the... Is there anybody here from Trinidad? Good. This is good. So I went there when I was 19 for two years with an organization called CUSO. I went to work with the YMCA. I was making $10 a week plus room and board. That was a lot of money back then, to believe it or not. And after I'd been there a month, the head of the YMCA went back to England and I was made the head of the YMCA of Port of Spain, Trinidad. I was 19. I knew very little. <laughs> well, after about a month, they said, we need to raise some money. Now, I know a lot about fundraising now because I ran the United Way and was vice president of a couple of universities. But I didn't know a lot about raising money then. And I've heard tonight about fund development for fame. So I'm going to suggest an idea to you. So I thought about it. And I thought, when I was 17, growing up in North Toronto, we used to sell Christmas trees for the YMCA. And through this brilliant idea, I thought if we sold Canadian Christmas trees in Trinidad, there'd be no competition. <laughs> I convinced the board of directors of the YMCA of Port of Spain, Trinidad, to order 1,500 Scots pine trees from the YMCA in St. John, New Brunswick, and put them on a ship down in the cargo hold, nice and cool, and they'd arrive fresh. Well, I got our young people involved, because you get people involved, and they went to the Canadian High Commission and the U.S. Embassy. They got the list of all Canadians and Americans living in Trinidad, and they went out and pre-sold 1,200 trees. I was looking pretty good. There was an article in the newspaper. My name was in it. I sent it home to my mother. My mother shared it with the Bridge Club. She was very proud of her son. Everything was going great. And December the 15th, the trees were to arrive, and they didn't. <laughs> Whew, I made a long distance call. I said, where are our trees? They said, oh, Mr. Cressy, we're terribly sorry. We should have called you. There was a fire on the ship. I said, oh, no. They said, good news. I said, what could be good? They said, we saved the trees. I said, well, where are they? They said, we put them on another ship, and they're coming down, and they should get there about December the 21st. I said, whoa, that's really close. They said, well, call Bermuda, see how the ship's doing. I put another long distance call into the Bermuda to discover that there was a dock worker strike in Bermuda. <laughs> they hoped it would clear in a few days and if all was well, the trees would arrive on December the 27th. There was an emergency meeting of the board of directors of the YMCA in which they put forward this motion to send this young Canadian volunteer home. It is at this point you need to adapt and adjust quickly with a good sense of humor. So I suggested that for that year only, we would have Christmas in Trinidad on December the 30th. This idea did not go over very well. And the next morning, two of the people on our board and myself went down to BWIA, British West Indian Airways, and suggested to them a wonderful marketing opportunity in which they would give us an airplane free of charge. We would take all the seats out of the airplane. We would fly the airplane to Grantley Adams Airport in Barbados. We would get the trees off the ship, put them on some trucks, drive the trucks out to the airport, take the trees off the trucks, and put them on the airplane and fly back to Trinidad and get them all ready to be sold. Lo and behold, they agreed. Headline, Trinidad Guardian newspaper, Christmas tree airlift to raise funds for local YMCA. And on Sunday, December the 22nd, two of us, two stewardesses, 10 bottles of Old Oak Trinidad rum, which is a very <laughs> fine rum, flew to Barbados, arriving all intact, got down to the docks to discover, we'd forgotten completely it was Sunday, and the dock workers weren't working. 
but many of them were around, and eight bottles later of Trinidad rum, they were working. And the trees came off the ship onto the docks. We put them on the trucks. We drove the trucks out to the airport. We took the trees off the trucks. We put them on the airplane, and two of us, two stewardesses on top of 1,500 Scots pine trees flew back to Trinidad, arriving all in pack at Piarco Airport, took the trees off the plane, put them on the trucks, drove down into Port of Spain, arrived at the YMCA Christmas carols, and in 48 hours, we sold out all the trees, made a profit of $8,000 for the local YMCA, and on December the 28th, the Trinidad government banned Canadian Christmas trees, <laughs> asking people to grow local trees, and we spawned a little cottage industry that exists to this day. Now, I thought that was the whole story, but there's a tiny part more, because about four years ago, this fellow in his 40s came to me and he said, you taught me how to swim at the YMCA. Here's a picture. And I said, oh, gee, that's right. I said, come to our house at Christmas time. We sing Christmas carols, and I tell the Christmas tree story now for the 18th time, much to my wife's chagrin, I might add. <laughs> So I told the story, and this young fellow got up and he said, there's another part to the story. And I said, what was that? He said, well, two of us were helping sell the trees, actually threw 20 of the trees over the back fence, went down on the corner, and we sold them ourselves and made $200 ourselves. <laughs> was the entrepreneurial spirit. And then about uh, two years ago, there's a fellow, Stuart McLean, who many of you were at a show called The Vinyl Cafe, and he said, it's the 40th anniversary of CUSO, and we heard about this Christmas tree stuff. Is that true? And I said, yes. And he said, could I put it on the radio? And I said, fine. So he did. And then I got a call that night from somebody in BC, and he said, is that a true story about those Christmas trees? And I said, yes. And he said, well, um, I'm a movie producer. I said, oh yes. I did the beachcombers and this and that. He said, did you ever see the movie Cool Runnings with John Candy about the Jamaican bobsled team? I said, yes, that was very funny. He said, this is the same movie in reverse. <laughs> so I was figuring out who'd be the star, Tom Cruise or something very exciting like that. My wife said to me, who's very smart, she says, you've built your whole life on one story. The movie will never get off the ground. Uh, and it hasn't. But if it does, I want you to know about it all. Now, you may wonder why I took so long on this story. There are two or three reasons. One, we need to have fun. We need to have fun. Mental illness is often not a lot of fun. We all know that. There is pain in mental illness. There is disconnect. There is often anger. We need to get to joy. And we can find joy in quite wonderful ways. Part of joy is finding the things that work. One of the things that Jim does that upsets me is he can still beat me on the golf course. We go out and we play golf. He has this very elegant swing. We get some joy there. We get joy on the ping pong table. Jim, I would think, would say he got great joy reading to my boys when they were young. They called him Uncle Jim. Now, where did that come from? I think because my boys treated Uncle Jim as their uncle. It was Uncle Jim. He helped teach them how to read. One of the things we need to understand is everybody can help somebody. Jim helps at the stroke club. He helps at the stroke club. There's this wonderful story of Sonia, who was 12, who was blind. And, and she was born blind. And when she was five, she went off to the school for the blind. And when she was 11, she went to her mom and dad and said, I want to go to an ordinary school. And her mom and dad said, but the school for the blind is good for you because they have everything. She said, I want to be with ordinary kids. She was a spunky little kid. And her mom and dad went to the school board. And they decided to have 
an experiment, a pilot project. They take 10 kids who are blind and put them in a regular school and see how it would work out. Well, you know what happened? Every time you take a risk, something spectacular can happen. And in this little school, beside the school, there was a daycare center. And every day, the daycare teacher used to read to the kids for nap time. And you know what the daycare teacher found? With the lights on and the sun coming through the window, the kids didn't take their nap. And she couldn't read that way. So she turned the lights out and she closed the blinds down. And then she found she couldn't read because it was too dark. So she used a flashlight and the kids were distracted. Sonia heard about the problem and she came in and she said, I'd like to read to the kids in the dark. I'd like to read to the kids in the dark. And of course she did by braille with her hands, which was the only way that she knew how to read. To the little kids, it was a bit like magic. Here was someone reading with their hands, but they took their nap. Now, what will those two and three-year-olds think when they grow up about blind people? Well, I think they'll view blind people as not people with a white cane to help across the street, but rather people who are worthy of being friends with as equals. We know that Sonia felt good. She was doing something that no one else could do. Now, in a number of daycare centers, Blind kids read to the people for nap time. My first full-time job after I had a degree in social work was running a group home for kids in trouble with the law. They'd be between the ages of 15 and 17. Now, I've learned a lot about group homes. People like them. The further away they're located from where they live, the more they like them. We had a nice group home. We cut our grass, our plants were nice, our neighbors didn't like us. Our neighbors didn't like us. So I had an open house to invite our neighbors. Our next door neighbor had an open house to see who was coming to our open house. We could not convince them talking. Well, in November, there was a major snowstorm, and I got our boys up early, and we shoveled everybody's walk. And then we stood on our porch as our neighbors came out. They didn't like us, but they saw that their walk was shoveled. Now, they could have taken the snow off the lawn, put it back on the walk, and shoveled it again. But they said, thank you. In the spring, there was a garbage strike. One thing you have to understand about garbage strikes they never in the history of the world have occurred in the winter. They always occur in the spring or the summer when garbage smells. We had a van. We picked up everybody's garbage. We took it to the dump. We took it to the dump. We put one of the people on the street on our board. And then when a window broke and a window did break, our neighbors had become our friends. One of our kids was very good at stealing television sets. He knew the size of every TV within a five block radius. One of the people who lived on our street owned a television store. He hired him part time. That kid today owns seven television stores. We took the skill and we put it in a different way. We need to find what those connections are. When I used to chair the board of the Toronto Board of Education, I talked to our principals and I said, get involved in the community. They didn't know what I was talking about back then, but somebody got it. One of them decided he would go around the corner to the senior citizen's home and he went there and he said, what do you think of us? We're your neighbor. And the head of the senior citizen's home said, we don't like you. Why? Well, your kids stomp on the grass, their language is bad. And then he said the magic words. 
And these are the magic words. What can I do to help? You're amazed if you use that line. Someone's really angry at you, stop, take a deep breath and say, what can I do to help? People don't know what to do next, right? What can I do to help? Well, all of a sudden this administrator of the senior citizen's home thought about it. And he said, well, 80% of the people who live in this senior's home are women. They're on a fixed income. They don't get to see a kid maybe on a Sunday afternoon if they're lucky. And they can't afford to get their hair done. Can you help? <gasps> Light goes on for the principal. There's a hairdressing program at the school. He goes back to the school. He talks to the head of hairdressing. Who gets their hair done? Well, the other kids and the rare teacher that will risk it. <laughs> Two weeks later, the seniors are coming across and getting their hair done free of charge. They're talking to the kids. The kids had already written off old people. And all of a sudden, now the kids are coming out and saying, oh, that woman was a nurse in China with Dr. Norman Bethune. We just studied about that. Some of the kids started to visit the seniors. The seniors then found they could have lunch in the school cafeteria far cheaper than anywhere else. The noise level in the school went way down. Well, that would be a nice story, but it's not quite the end. And the end is this. The budget cuts came at the school board. The Teachers Federation came down and said, don't cut the budget, it will hurt the kids. The trustees listened and they realized that was a self-interest argument. Yes, the teachers were concerned about the kids, but the teachers didn't live in their area and the teachers were also concerned about their job. When three busloads of seniors from Chester Village came down to the board and seniors all vote and said, don't cut the budget, it'll hurt the kids. The school board listened and they didn't cut the budget. What had happened in each of those instances, in the group home and in the school, the people had earned it. They'd earned it. One of the things we need to do in mental illness is just not get up and shout, but we gotta earn it. We got good stories to tell. We got breakthroughs to talk about. We got statistics, we got information, and we need more money for research. And we know that clearly. We need to convince those people in power and politics that this is the right thing to do. We listened to Tony Clement, he talks about support for this. And we don't know he'll be here in a couple of weeks, but he might be. And if he is, we want him as an advocate. And if not, if the opposition come to power, we want them as advocates. But as important, it seems to me, as breakthroughs in research is the dignity of everybody as a human being. That's about how we treat each other. That is about taking time. That is about being a bit patient. That is when people shout at us who are ill, taking it. It's not easy sometimes. We know that. It's not easy sometimes. Groups like FAME make a difference. The work of Scott Simme and Julia make a difference. The Michael Wilsons coming out and speaking in public make a difference. We, in the end, are about making a difference. The Last Taboo was a great title. If we are looking for this decade, the breakthrough, and we've seen breakthroughs in health in the 1900s, it is the breakthrough of mental health. It is getting it on the front burner. It is talking about it as individuals and as friends and as neighbors. It is about quality of life. And it is about going for joy. And it is finding the stories that connect. Sometimes it's poetry, sometimes it's song, sometimes it's skill set. My wife works at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. 
Last year they had the exhibit, the art exhibit of people from around North America. It was extraordinary, extraordinary. There was a little bit in the press, not a lot. There was a little bit. So as we look to advocates, we should always start with ourselves of what can I do? And I guess my challenge is we can all do a little more. We can do it on our street. We can do it with our sons and our daughters. We can do it with our moms and dads. And for my mom and dad, who've now both passed away, they said, in the end, we are our brother's keeper. We can do it in the advance in drugs. But in the end, we build community. We build community by understanding, accepting each other and our differences. All people dream, but not equally. Those who dream at night in the dusty recesses of their mind awake to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous people, for they may act their dreams with open eyes to make it happen. We must all have great dreams. We must not ever give up. To make a great dream happen, one must first have that great dream. We want that for our children. We want it for our brothers and sisters. We want it in terms of dignity. And then when great dreams start to happen, and we see those breakthroughs, let us celebrate them. Let us shout it to the rafters. Because it creates a motivation, an incentive, that we can all break through. And we are the better for that. Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, centuries ago said this, Go to the people, live with them, and love them. Start with what they know and build on what they have. But of our best leaders, when their job is done, the task accomplished, the people all say, we did it ourselves. We did it ourselves. The strength, in the end, is holding hands and then being able to let go a little so people move on. My father was a banker all his life and when he retired he gave me a poem and I'd like to share it with you. It was called Around the Corner and it goes like this. Around the corner I have a friend in this great city that knows no end. Yet days go by and weeks rush on and before I know it a year is gone and I never see my dear friend's face. For life is a swift and fateful race. Oh, he knows I like him just as well as in the days when I rang his bell and he rang mine. We were younger then, but now we're busy, tired men, tired with playing a foolish game, tired with trying to make a name. Tomorrow, I say, I'll call on Jim just to show that I'm thinking of him. But tomorrow comes and tomorrow goes, and the space between us grows and grows around the corner, yet miles away. Here's a telegram, sir. Jim died today, and that's what we get and deserve in the end, around the corner, a forgotten friend. My father's message was about keeping in touch. Keeping in touch with family, with friends, with people who struggle. So my challenge to you is simply this. When you go home tonight, call somebody you've been thinking about calling. You will feel much better for it, and so will they. As a matter of fact, I am very tired, and I'm never again going to send a Christmas card that says, must get together for lunch this year. We've all had them, and you know what it means? You'll get another Christmas card next year with the same message. Forget the card. Phone the person up. Talk with them. We are the better for connecting. Mental illness is about connecting. 
It is about going deep inside ourselves to hold on when we need to, hug when we need to, and be there. And be there. And understand that each of us has a responsibility, and that responsibility is not to walk away. Not to be a spectator. Our responsibility is to be a participant. Frankly, we're talking here about the field of action. Each of us needs to get one other to get involved. And that's how that flame grows, because we reach out to one another. Well, the statistics are in. We read about them last week in the paper. You know, the numbers of young people who are depressed is extraordinary. The connection sometimes with even their own family is not as high as it should be. When we see the signal, and we now know how to detect the signals, is get there. The work of uh, the Center, Center for Addiction and Mental Health around first episodes is terrific today. It is breakthrough stuff. We get people at the start. And once we do that, then we, each of us have an obligation. That's what an alumni is all about. Well, let me bring this to a close. Fame has a key role. That role is about telling the stories. There are lots of stories out there. The story of my brother Bill and Jim is no different than hundreds and thousands of them. But once we get that story out, to others, then another story pops up, and another one. We will break through because we are tenacious. We will preserve. And if we learned anything from Michael and Al Bernie's, you stay the course, drive along that Bluer Viaduct today. It actually looks gorgeous. They stayed the course. They made some friends. They did what I call nudge, nurture, nudge, nurture, and every once in a while they had to hit somebody en route. And they made some new friends. They made some new friends. My mother used to put it, that song when we were young, make new friends and keep the old. One is silver and the other is gold. That is absolutely true. We are making new friends through this cause. But we don't forget our old friends. And every time we get somebody on side, hug them. Don't let them go. Hug them. We start with our family and we reach out. So in asking me here tonight, really what you've asked me to do is share. Sharing is how we make a difference. Making a difference is about participation and is about action. It is not going silent. The silence is now over. Never again let us be silent. Let us stand up with confidence and say that mental health is on the front of the agenda. Let us have those who are mentally ill be our spokespeople, because their stories are real. And when we have those breakthroughs, champion them. Grand dreams, joy, and humor are what will sustain us when the tough times come. And they do come but it is keeping on the positive side is how we break through. I thank you for having me. Thanks very much. Please don't go away. <laughs>